They threw him into the sea, they put him in boiling oil. They tried so many different ways, several times, not just one time. But Harami Kashiko, seeing that Prahlad could not be killed, he, he became despondent. And he began to reflect on the matter and thought, maybe I will be killed. Maybe this boy will kill me. So he became worried about his own life. However, the two sons of Sukracharya reassured Harani Kashipu and told him, don't worry, he's just a young boy. You know, when children are young, they, they, they're, they're not the same. As they grow up, they'll change. Don't worry about it. He'll be a, let him mature. As he grows up, he will change. So Harani Kashipu was convinced maybe it will be okay. But then, of course, Prahlad is in the Gurukul, and he was instructing his friends in the Gurukul about the nature of the material world. And he was telling them how in a, if we live to be 100 years, and if we sleep 12 hours a day, we're spending 50 years sleeping. So we, we waste a lot of our life. The human life is very valuable and every moment is very important. It's, it's very rare to get the human form of life. And if we waste our time in things like sense gratification and just simply sleeping and eating, then we're very unfortunate. So Prahlad Maharaj was explaining to the boys in the Gurukul the first ten years are spent in boyhood, just growing up, learning to walk and talk. And then another ten years are spent playing games, <laughs> football, and cricket, and this and that, you know. So many things we do between the ages of like, you know, ten to twenty even, you know, you see the young men also, they play these games. So like that twenty years, first twenty years can be spent doing nothing, just wasting the valuable time. And then in old age, when we get old, we suffer invalidity. You cannot see, you cannot hear, you cannot move so well. Everything becomes a, a lot of trouble. And you may spend the last 20 years of our life in that way. You could imagine if you live to be a hundred, you're not going to be very strong in your senses, you know, diff very difficult in elderly age to move around, and to talk, and to just do activities which we would do very easily while we are young. So Prahlad Maharaj was explaining like this, half the life spent sleeping, 10 years, 20 years growing up, another 20 years dying, the life is wasted. And the whatever time is left, we have to work so hard just to maintain the family and everything else that there's no time left. So Prahlad Maharaj was warning his friends in the Gurukul that we should become very careful to use, make good use of our time and especially in the beginning of life, while we're young, to use this time to understand our real self, our spiritual being, spirit souls. And Prahlad Maharaj gave examples about, just like ge geologists, and they may be looking for gold in the earth. So one who's trained in the science, they can find out what kind of minerals, what kind of gold, where the gold is in the earth. He said in the same way, one has to be trained in spiritual science to understand that within the body, there's the eternal spiritual particle. Without being trained in spiritual knowledge, it's very hard for people to understand. Most people in the world are just simply in the bondage of material existence. They only think of themselves as the body. And they think at the time, end of life, the body is finished. Prabhupada went to Russia to preach to the Professor Katowski, a famous uh, meeting, Prabhupada, on a very short visit in 1971, while Russia was still a communist country, Prabhupada had gone to Moscow 
and he met the professor of Asian studies in the University of Moscow. His name was Professor Kotovsky. So Prabhupada was explaining to him the Vedic knowledge and talking and telling him about how at the time of death the soul leaves the body, you take another birth. But the professor didn't accept. The professor said, no, no, Swamiji, at the time of death everything is finished. So ordinary people in the illusion of material life, they all think the time of death everything is finished. However, those who are properly educated, who understand the science of the soul, they know that at the time of death, the soul leaves the body and will take another body. And we should be very careful to make good use of this body, because the consciousness which we have in this body will determine the type of body we take in the next life. If you don't mind becoming a dog or a tree in the next life, then it doesn't matter. But if we are if we are concerned about this, if we want to make the best use of this human life, then we should try to understand our spiritual self. And then at least we can be sure to come back in the human form of life and to progress on. Well, ideally, we want to get out of the wheel of birth and death. We want to go back to, this, to the kingdom of God, to the spiritual world. To do that, however, we have to become pure. We have to get free of material desires. So long as we maintain material desires, we have to come back into this world. So Prahlad was preaching to the children in the Gurukula and he was telling them, you know, people endeavor so much for happiness. But he said, as soon as they begin to try for happiness, that is the beginning of their distress. When they're actually not worried about happiness, when they just simply do their duty, that's when they're actually happy. But the more we try and plan for our happiness, the more we meet with distress. We should understand the nature of this material world. And we should work. We should make proper use of our time to cultivate God consciousness so that we can be liberated from the wheel of birth and death. So all the boys in the Guru Kul became convinced hearing Prahlad's preaching. And they decided they would also become like Prahlad. They would also become devotees. And they all began to chant the holy names of the Lord. So the teachers, however, were very upset. And they went immediately to Hrani Kashipu and warned him what was happening. That Prahlad had made all the other boys like him. That they would also become followers, devotees of Vishnu. So when Harani Kashipu heard this, then he came himself, and he was ready to kill Prahlad himself. And he came waving his sword, telling Prahlad that this is it, I'm going to kill you today, I'm going to chop off your head. And, and it, but before he actually took any action against Prahlad, he asked Prahlad, where is this? Who, who do you get all your power from? Where do you get all this power of yours from? And Prahlad said, well, I get it from the same person. You get it from Father. Everything comes from God. Everything comes from Him. Right? Aham sarvasya prabhavo mata sarvam Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, I am the source of everything material and spiritual. So Prahlad Maharaj was telling his father, I get my power from the same person you get your power from. It all comes from the Supreme Lord of Vishnu. So then Harani Kashipu is very angry. So he wants to know, where is this God of yours? Where is he? And, and Prahlad is on the highest level of devotion. And he says to his father, he's everywhere, father. Because one who is on the topmost platform, they see God everywhere, in everything, right? There are different levels of devotee. On the lowest level of devotion, 
There's the Kanista devotee. They see God in the temple. They think God is only in the temple. They cannot see God in the heart of other living entities. On the intermediate level, one is one one makes distinction because on the intermediate level, one will one will be he will want to give the knowledge of Krishna consciousness. So he makes distinction between the innocent and the envious. Those who are innocent, he will give them mercy, he will give them that knowledge. But those who are envious and who are blasphemous, he will avoid them. He won't try to preach to them because they're envious. And if you try to preach, they'll just become more envious and more blasphemous. So it's not good to try to convince better to just avoid them. So, on the topmost level, however, Prahlad Maharaj sees God everywhere. So, when his father asked him, where is your God? He said, he is everywhere. So, Harani Kashiku wants to know, is he in this pillar? And he punched the pillar, and Prahlad Maharaj said, yes, Father, he's there also. And Lord Nishringadev appeared from the pillar. And it's not surprising that the Lord could appear from a pillar. Because the Lord, you know, he doesn't have to always appear from the womb of his devotees. Sometimes he does. But just like we see Lord Varaha. Lord Varaha took birth from the nostril of Lord Brahma. Hmm. Unbelievable, isn't it? Someone can take birth from the nostril of someone. Did we ever see that? So Lord Varaha appeared in that way. In the same way, Lord Nishringadev took his birth from the pillar. Uh, of course, he was, all, he was always, he's everywhere in everything. And he appeared from the pillar to satisfy the words of his devotee, Prahlad. Because Prahlad is telling Lord Nishringadev, he's everywhere, he's in everything. So the Lord wants to fulfill the desires of his devotee. He came out from the pillar. And when Harani Kashi Puso saw this farm, ferocious farm, half lion, half man, then Harani Kashi Pu understands, oh, now I have now you've come to fight with me, and they have a great battle. And at one point even it seemed like Harani Kashi Pu was going to do well in the battle. Because although Lord Nishringadev had initially grabbed him, somehow Harani Kashipu got free from the hold of Lord Nishringadev. And when he got free from the clutches of Lord Nishringadev, he said, Now I'm going to show you. You know, just like sometimes it's that Garuda would catch a snake. And sometimes holding the snake, sometimes the snake would slip out from the beak of Garuda. But of course. Garuda would again get the snake. In the same way, Harani Kashipu was again taken in the clutches of Lord Nishringadev. And Lord Nishringadev took Harani Kashipu, placed him across his lap, and ripped him apart using his nails. Because he has claws of the lion, and he bifurcated Harani Kashipu. Took out the intestines, from Arani Kashipu and put them around his neck. A nice garland. Huh? <laughs> A garland of intestines. All black, you know. <laughs> so, Lord Nishringadev was very angry because uh, he had come in this very ferocious form. Lions are not usually gentle creatures, you know. They're, they're known to be ferocious. So Lord Nishringadev was half lion. He was particularly ferocious. He was particularly angry because he had seen all the difficulties, all the hardships which his devotee Prahlad had gone through. Prahlad had been put through so many trials and tribulations. We should understand when when Harani Kashipu was trying to take the life of Prahlad, Prahlad 
did not have to pray to the Lord for protection. You know, when we're in danger, we pray, Oh, Krishna, help me. Oh, God, save me. You know, but Prahlad, he is always Krishna conscious. And in every situation, he's simply remembering the Lord. So even he's placed in the boiling aisle, he's just simply remembering the Lord. And the aisle became cool. And he's thrown off the mountain, but he simply remembers the Lord. And the Lord arranges to save him and deliver him. So this is the highest level of devotion. Prahlad Maharaj is a Nitya Siddha. He's a, a, an eternally liberating soul. And he come to take part in this wonderful pastime with Lord Nisringadi. So it's, of course, it's surprising that such a great devotee could be born in the family of such a demon. However, this demon, Harani Kashipu, is no ordinary demon. So after Lord Nisringadi had taken the life of Harani Kashipu, then uh, all the different demigods were trying to pacify the anger of Lord Nisringadi. Lord Brahma came and offered prayers. Then Lord Shiva came. Then Lord Indra came. And all, many other different demigods from the, the Gandharvas, the Siddhas, all different, the, the, the Prajapatis, they all came, they were all offering prayers, trying to pacify the anger of Lord Nishringade. But they were not successful. They even brought Lakshmi. Now Lakshmi is the wife, the consort of Lord Nishringade. And she had, of course, she had seen this form before, because this form of Lord Nishringade, this is an eternal form. The Lord has his form, he has his own planet in the spiritual world. And he also has appeared previously in every Kalpa, Lord Nishringade appears. So Lakshmi had seen this form before, but by the, nature, by the power of the Leela Shakti, the energy of pastime, Lakshmi was not able to immediately, and rather than, and, and also Lord Nishringade, he wants to generate this mood of Adbhuta Ras, this, ad, we sing Tabakara Kamala, Adbhuta Shringa, right? Adbhuta, wonder, astonishment, that, oh, you know, this, the Lord has come in this amazing form, you know, half lion, half, very ferocious, very sharp teeth and dazzling eyes and big claws, and he's very angry. So Lakshmi comes before the Lord, but she is also not able to pacify Lord Nishringade. Then, after all the different demigods had attempted, then it was decided, let Prahlad try. Let that little boy try. So Prahlad came forward and offered full obeisances before Lord Nishringadev. And Lord Nishringadev then placed his palm onto the head of Prahlad Maharaj. By placing his lotus hand onto the head of Lord Nishringadev, he was empowering him to offer prayers to him. The Lord, we say, to, to those who are constantly tisham satitayukhanam bhajatam priti purvakam. Krishna said, I give the understanding by which they may come to me. So Lord Nishringadev inspired Prahlad Maharaj to speak and to offer prayers. And Prahlad Maharaj spoke wonderfully, glorifying the Lord. And also he was describing to Lord Nishringadev, he said, I am not in need of anything from you. Because he said, wherever I go, I can simply chant your glories. I can chant the holy name and I can remember all your pastimes. But he said, I am concerned with love for those who have no knowledge of your pastimes, of your glories. For those who are against you, who are opposed to you, for those who are envious and demons. 
I feel compassion for them. Just like in Lord Chaitanya's time, there was one devotee called Vasudev Datta. And Vasudev Datta requested Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu that let me take the sins of all these people and let them all be liberated and I will stay here and suffer for them. Lord Chaitanya was so happy. Would you like to do that? Would you like to take the karma for all these people? All these cow killers, meat eaters, drunkards, all these sinful people. Would you be willing to take karma for even one of them? Not very common. No. But Vasudevdata requested Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, let me take... Uh, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was so pleased, he said, you are... You must be in the... You're like Prahlad Maharaj. Because this was Prahlad Maharaj's mood. That he wanted to see everyone delivered. He did not care about his own self. Now, just like we say, for a devotee of the Lord, Narayana Parasarve, Nakutas Chinyavidyate, Swarga, Apavarga Narakesh, Vapitu Yata Darshana. The devotees who have taken shelter of Lord Narayan, they don't see any difference between heaven and hell and liberation. Wherever they go, they're going to chant the name of the Lord, they're going to engage in devotional service. So it doesn't make any difference to them. But Prahlad Maharaj requests Lord Nishringadi kindly deliver these fallen souls. And particularly Prahlad was concerned about his own father. So it happened after Prahlad had offered his prayers to Lord Nishringadi, then Lord Nishringadi requests Prahlad Maharaj that you should ask some benediction for me. You know, usually when we offer prayers, at the end of our prayers, we will offer, first of all, when we offer prayers, first you should glorify the Lord. And then after you glorify the Lord, then you may like to put in your, you know, your little request on the end. By the way, <laughs> Lord, <laughs> kindly remember, <laughs> remember me, help me pass my exam, give me this job, uh, <laughs> give me good health, long life, you know. Like this, we have many requests. And so, Prahlad Maharaj, however, told Lord Nishringadev that I, I, didn't want, I don't want anything. That if I have to ask something from you, that's like a business agreement, a business arrangement. And if the servant has to take some uh, benediction from the master, then he's not a real servant. He's motivated. He just wants to get something from the Master. That's not the best servant. And similarly, if the Master thinks he has to get something from the servant, that the servant has to do something for him, then he's not a real Master either. The Prabhupada often told us, devotional service means to finish doing business. In material life we do business. We will work, we want to know how much are you paying me. No, we don't work for nothing, rarely anyway. Of course, Prabhupada began the Krishna consciousness movement in that way. In Prabhupada's time, nobody received any salary. We were all young at that time. We didn't worry about it. We lived in the ashram and we were happy, chanting and dancing and distributing books and telling people about Krishna. So Prabhupada didn't like that we had to face devotees to do devotional service. Of course, nowadays it's a, a little different in, in places, you know, we have many householders and they have families and they have to maintain their family. So sometimes the temple has to make some arrangement to give them some uh, funds to maintain their self. Of course, they don't get big salaries. Yeah. <laughs> it's not like working in some multinational company, but just enough to cover their basic needs. So that's a lot. But Prahlad Maharaj is telling Lord Nishingadev, 
I don't want, I'm not a businessman, I don't want anything. But Lord Nishimi didn't say, no, you should ask something, you should get something, you must take something. So then Prahlad Maharaj then said, then bless me, that in my heart there will be no desire for sense gratification. Of course, that is the nature of the pure devotee. The pure devotees do not have any desire for sense gratification. Pure devotional service is described. Anya bilasita sunyam jnana karma jana vritam anuku yena krishna no shilanam vaktir uttama. Prahlad Maharaj, he is the uttama bhakta, the highest devotee. So in his heart, there is no desire for any material gain, or even he has no desire for liberation. He simply wants devotional service. So, he, he did, Prahlad Maharaj, however, does mention to Lord Nishingadev that, however, I am concerned about my father, that I know my father has been very sinful. He did many sinful things. He, he, he harmed the brahmanas, he stopped all the yagyas, and he did so many bad things that and, and then he fought with you, he, he tried to fight with you, that I'm concerned that he may go to hell. So, can I request that he doesn't go to hell? That he can be delivered? And Lord Nishingadev tells Prahlad Maharaj, you don't have to worry, Prahlad, because your father was fighting with me, so by my touch, he's already purified. <laughs> Right? Lord Nishringadev picked him up and touched him and everything with his nails. And so, by the touch of my hands, he's freed from all of his sins. And not only your father, but your forefathers for 21 generations, both from the side of your father and your mother, they're all delivered for 21 generations. So, this benediction, this was uh, very pleasing to Prahlad Maharaj to hear like this, that his father would not have to go to hell, he would not have to see hell. So Srila Prabhupada points out in his purports in the, at the end of this chapter, he tells us, he encourages all of us, that if somebody like Prahlad Maharaj, who was so sinful and who was so envious of the Lord, if he can be delivered, then there's, if we simply engage in loving service to Krishna, then our deliverance should also not be a problem. Right? Because if we simply engage chanting the holy name and doing our service, doing the menial service for the Lord, bowing before Him, chanting the holy name, hearing the scriptures, taking the Lord's prasadam, then certainly we will also be qualified to be delivered from this material existence. So, this is a, you might say this is a real message which comes up from this pastime of Lord Nishringade. That if a great demon like Lord Nish, uh, like Hiranyakashipu can be delivered by the mercy of the Lord, then certainly all of our devotees should also be delivered. We just have to stay in Krishna consciousness. That is the important thing. Don't go away. Right? There, there, that famous verse in the Srimad Bhagavatam, Tate na kampam sushamikshamana panjana evatma kritam vipakam rigvak vabhuvir vividan namaste Jiveta yom mukti pade sadaya bhak. The verse is describing that one who accepts all, uh, all of the calamities which come in their life, one accepts them all as the arrangement of the Lord and to be reactions due to his past sins, but goes on engaging in devotional service with his body, mind, and words then he becomes qualified to become my honorary devotee. It becomes his rightful claim. 
the verses Sadaya Bhak and the Acharyas explain Sadaya Bhak means that it becomes the, the, the right of the devotee to inherit whatever property the father has. Is it? The question is, what does a, a son have to do to inherit the property of the father? You know, if your father is a rich man, what do you need to do to get your father's property? You just simply have to stay alive, right? You wait for the father to die, right? right? In course of time, as we get, as the father dies, the father's property becomes the property of the son. So in the same way, one just simply has to remain in, engaged in devotional service. And naturally, it becomes automatic for the devotee to go back to God. There's no doubt. There's no question about it. It's automatic. The Lord delivers the devotee. It's his rightful claim to enter into the kingdom of God. I just got a message just today, one disciple of Jaipataka Swami Maharaj, a woman, the wife of, of one of my friends there in Malaysia, and she's very nice, very sweet devotee. I just got an email that she left her body yesterday. Her name was Shama Puja Devi Dasi. And along with her husband, her husband Ananda Dulao, they do this service in Malaysia because in Malaysia, you know, they have maybe Ratiatra about 30 or 40 times a year. <laughs> Many different places, you know, different parts of the city, they have a Rathi, so many different places they have Ratiatra there. And they have these big Jagannath deities. And Ananda Dulao and his wife, the Shama Puja Mataji, they had the service, they would drive the Jagannath deities around. They would take the Jagannath deities to all the different places there, wherever there's a Rathi Atra. They would bring the deities for the festival. So they were doing this very nice service, taking care of Lord Jagannath. That was their service throughout the year, taking care of Lord Jagannath, and whenever that Rathi Atra, they bring him to the different city or the different town for the festival. And so she left her body just yesterday, or just maybe even this morning. But uh, I feel that there's nothing to be lamented. A devotee dies to live, and in living tries to spread the holy name. So the departure of a devotee is like that, that we don't consider it uh, a disaster, but rather we see that she has gone on to a higher service in the association of the devotees in the kingdom of God. So she was full-time serving Lord Jagannath, she has gone off to serve Jagannath some other place. So, any question? Yes, Prabhupada. Nothing particularly about Narsimha pastime, but I wanted to request you if you could share your experiences of preaching in China. Well, preaching in China is not really any different from other places. It's the same thing, you know, everywhere you have difficulties. People in China, in some ways, uh, they're open-minded because they have never been exposed to a lot of things which are around the world. Now, of course, as China opens up, more and more things are entering. But, it's, you know, it's not really any different from anywhere else. You know, people are materialistic also there, because it's by, uh, it officially it's a communist country, and so com communism don't recognize religion. And although they tolerate some religions, the people are indoctrinated into communism, and they're, when you, you study at the university, you're programmed into communism, 
and you learn that religion is the opium of the people. It's not encouraged. It's frowned on. It's not, you know. And if, if you want to be a member of, a commun of the Communist Party, you have to give up any affiliation with any kind of religious organization. And so <laughs> that's the one problem, one major problem. Otherwise, it's not any different from other places. You know, to be a vegetarian there is not difficult. They have a lot of fruits, a lot of vegetables available. It's not, not difficult. People, of course, they don't speak the language, but if you're going to preach, you have to know the language. Prabhupada went to America, he could speak English. So <laughs> he could preach to the people. <coughs> There's a saying in Chinese, Jian ren zheng ren hua, jian gui zheng gui hua. <laughs> the, meaning, the meaning is, among, the, among the, the, the people, you should speak the language of the people. And among the ghosts, you should speak the language of the ghosts. <laughs> Interesting expression. Uh, how are they accepting the Krishna consciousness of philosophy? Well, like Bhagavad Gita said, Manushya Nam Sahasri you know, out of thousands among men, hardly one is endeavoring for perfection. You know, it's China is by for the five thousand years of materialism. Their philo their culture, their philosophy is all materialistic. It's all materialism. So generally it's only a very small minority of people who are interested you know, in Krishna consciousness. And we have of course our four regulated principles, which is a great challenge to materialistic people. But still, you know, we can get some. We get, the, you know, Prabhupada said when one person, one boy in Hong Kong took initiation, one Chinese man took initiation from in Srila Prabhupada's time, and Prabhupada said it's like having one sandalwood tree in the forest. There's so many trees in the forest, but if you have one sandalwood tree in the forest, the whole forest is glorious. So he said that one Chinese devotee is like the sandalwood tree in the forest. And that one devotee, he, you know, he translated many books of Prabhupada. Oh, so he did a lot. It was a great help in introducing Krishna consciousness. Just like Prabhupada went to Russia, and he was only there for a few days, but he met one young Russian man. And Prabhupada spent time with him, talking with him and answering his questions. And that Russian man, that young Russian man, went on to spread the knowledge of Krishna consciousness all over Russia and make many devotees. So, you know, we don't look so much at quantity. <laughs> One moon is better than millions of stars. Right? You have one moon, that's the important thing. Prabhupada had, you know, many disciples, but, you know, but not all moons <laughs> to be able to do wonderful things. But that Russian boy did wonderful things. And even though he was tortured and put in hospital and given drugs and so on, he suffered so much. But still he was uh, blessed to have done such wonderful service on behalf of Krishna consciousness. So preaching Krishna consciousness in different parts of the world, it's, it's the same everywhere. There are always challenges. You may think, you know, America is a free country. But look at America, you know, does it mean more people in America are interested in Krishna consciousness? You know, people are also cow killers there, they eat all kinds of beef, and they're very sinful. And they may say, oh, it's a Christian country, and the, gover the government is open, they tolerate religion, you have the First Amendment in America, 
freedom of religion, you can practice any religion you want. Does it mean that people will be more Krishna conscious there? Not at all. It's a very difficult field of preaching. Western countries. Well, countries are open, but it doesn't make preaching any easier. But still, we have to endeavor. We have to. Krishna, Krishna sends people. There are people looking for knowledge. They need that offer, they need that mercy. So we have to be willing to tolerate, just like Prahlad, he tolerated so much. So many difficulties. He, he did not give up his compassionate nature. So that's important in preaching, that we have to have that compassion. We have to feel some caring for the people that they're suffering so much. And we want to try to save them. Prahlad Maharaj was always praying that these souls could be delivered. So we should also try to feel genuine compassion and think how to deliver these people. How to bring them out of their materialistic illusions. Prahlad, I think we understand that he is a pure devotee of the Lord. So, in that situation, why did he ask that uh, Lord to remove all the mental hankerings from his heart? No, he blessed it. That in my heart there will never be any material desire. That it will remain pure. He didn't want that it should ever become any different from what it was. That was his request. Not to remove what's there, but that he, in his heart there will never be any material desire. And sometimes people are very devoted at one point, but then they fall away and they go back into material life. Somehow we become attracted again. We for, forget Krishna. Just like Prahlad's mother was there in the ashram of Narada Muni, and she was serving Narada Muni, and she was hearing from Narada Muni. But after some time, after her husband came back and she went back home, and then she forgot everything. So it happens. We see many people come to Krishna consciousness, but somehow, you know, they don't always remain. So Prahlad was praying that, bless me in my heart, there will never be any material desire. Maharaj, uh, regarding, uh, I just wanted to know, the places in, near to Mayapur, the University of Pali is there. Mm -hmm. And uh, in Andhra Pradesh, we have Ahovila is there. Mm -hmm. So, can you just uh, throw some light on the pastimes of nursing Deva, one of these places? Nishringa Pali? Well, Nishringa Pali, I can tell you that uh, that's the place where Lord Nishringa Dev came to rest after he fought with Aranyakashiki. And there's also at the side of the, it's a, there's a river there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, at the side of the river said the demigods all came there because Lord Nishringadeva was resting. So the demigods all came and lived there. And the residences were there while Lord Nishringadeva was resting. Lord Nishringadeva also appeared 500 years ago to Chankasi. <laughs> the Chankasi broke the Madanga and stopped the Sankirtan movement. So at that time, Lord Chaitanya organized civil disobedience. Not, they made a big protest through all of Navadvi, marching, chanting, and they put Haridas Thakur at the front, because Haridas Thakur is Mohammedan, you see? So he was in the front dancing, and they came to the Chankasi's house, and the Chankasi had to come out, and there was an angry mob, and they were, you know, they were very antagonistic towards the Chankasi. The Chankasi had stopped Sankirtan, no more Sankirtan, and broke the Madanga. He said, I'll punish all of you if you do any more Sankirtan. And, and, but then Lord Chaitanya organized this big procession to, against the disobedient, a disobedience movement, you could say. So the Chankasi came out and he spoke to Lord Chaitanya. They spoke for some time about killing cows. There was a discussion about that. But then Lord Chaitanya asked the Kasi, he said, what about our Sankirtan? Are you, what about our Sankirtan? What do you say about that? 
And then Chan Kazi said, I want to speak to you in private. But Lord Chaitanya said, no, it's okay. These men here, they're all my intimate associates. Whatever you have to say, you can say in front of them. So then the Chan Kazi told Lord Chaitanya that after he had broken the Madanga drum, that night in his room, in his bedroom, a very ferocious figure had appeared and jumped on his chest and took him by the throat and shook him and said, if you ever do like that again, I will certainly rip you apart. <coughs> Don't you ever threaten my devotees. Don't you ever break my madanga. Mm -hmm. Because madanga was clay, you know. We used to only have clay madanga. It's only recently we have these fiberglass drums. <laughs> but Lord Chaitanya's time, it was all clay. And uh, Nishing, Lord Nishingadev took his nails across the chest of the Chankasi. And the Chankasi opened his shirt and showed Lord Chaitanya the nail marks right across his chest. Chan Kazi said, I'm just warning you, just to let you know what will happen if you ever do this again. So the Chan Kazi vowed at that time, he said, from now on, none of I and none of my descendants will ever interfere with the Sankirtan movement. And uh, the Chan Kazi even joined the Sankirtan of Lord Chaitanya. And he marched with Lord Chaitanya as he chanted the holy name. And so the Samadhi of the Chankasi is there in Mayapur, and the, the, the Chankasi's nickname was Champak. So there's a big Champak tree, and there's also a Neem tree. So symbolizing that Lord Chaitanya and the Chankasi, that they were friends together. The Chankasi supported Lord Chaitanya. So that was Lord Nishingadev's appearance there in the uh, 500 years ago in the times of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And the Shingapali is an ancient place. That it's a, a small temple there. It said the Lord Nishingadeva had come there to that place to wash his, not, not to wash his hand, but to rest there. Now a Hobalam, of course, that's another different place. That's a, they say this is where Lord Chaitanya, this is where Lord Nishingadeva resided. But according to Bhagavatam, it's more the heavenly planets, you know. We, but Prabhupada said, anyway, people have faith in these places. There's a number of Nishingadi temples there, and many great acharyas also visited there in Havala. I think Ramanuj Acharya also had gone there, Nishingapali. And uh, there's a place also, Nishingachia, Nishingachia, what's the place that Vishakapatna Vish there? Near Simhachal. Uh, Simhachal. Simhachal. Right. Simhachal. There's a Nishinga <coughs> there. Simhachal. Lord Chaitanya got there and chanted Nishinga Mantra there. Simhachal. Okay. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Nishinga Bhagavan Ki. Srila Prabhupada Ki. Well, thank you very much. We are very much grateful for accepting invitation and coming us and blessing us. So we'll express our gratitude to Maharaj by chanting loudly one time Hare Krishna Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Tomorrow is Ekadashi. Tomorrow, Ekadashi evening bogus offered by His Grace Swami Sundar Prabhu and Shaklam Mataji and also Mani Prabhu on the occasion of daughter marriage on 15th April. And today's evening bogus is co sponsored by His Grace Chidan and the Janatan Prabhu and Her Grace Sri Rupa Kamala Mataji. So also there is an announcement on Friday's Narasimha Chaturthashi. So we will have special Narasimha Sahasra Narmarchana from 6.30 to 7.30 p.m. Election of Friday. So initiated devotees can bring only a pump and tulsi leaves to offer to the Lord. Hare Krishna. So detailed program will be announced. So now we will conclude the program with Narasimha Maharaj. Maharaj, you will see.